Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now it's good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We have visitors here. We're glad to have you. We appreciate our visitors. And you that's listening out in the radio listen audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping today we can be a real inspiration to you. And you in the radio listen audience, if you'll call someone on the phone, and especially a shut-in and have them to tune in and get the Northside Baptist Church Hour. We'll do our best to be a blessing to them. And so now at this time, we'll turn the uh, service over to Paul, our music director. And I'm sure what he has lined up for us to be a blessing to our hearts. So Paul, at this time. Turn to page 151. Praise him, praise him. Bible turn to Hebrews chapter 2 next Sunday is Easter next Sunday night we'll be having a baptismal service at the close of the regular service those that's waiting to be baptized you remember this invite your friends and neighbors to come to church with you next Sunday a lot of people like to go to church on Easter and if you see some people that don't have a church home, I just recently come to the Athens area. Maybe you'd invite them to come with you to Northside. Be glad to have them. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 2. I want to begin reading with verse 9 and read through verse 18. I do have a little hoarseness. I hope you'll bear with me. I probably won't be, I hope it won't be too monotonous. I just pray for him and bear with me as we bring the message today. Now, since next Sunday is Easter, and we'll, uh, of course, uh, be celebrating the resurrection of our dear Lord, commemorating that great occasion, I want to speak today on his suffering. Now, before he died, he suffered tremendously. 
And I want to talk about that today. Just a few days ago, we visited some areas where Jesus suffered. We went to Caiaphas' home where he was brought before the high priest. We went down into a dungeon where he was possibly kept there maybe overnight. We saw the place where they scourged people and how they placed their hands there in uh, bands and how they have to bend over and there they take these whips and they whip them, they scourge them. We saw the place where our dear Lord was scourged and then of course as we travel down through old Jerusalem, down the trail that Jesus traveled according to tradition, as he carried his cross, as we come to station after station, the guide pointed out certain things that happened at these stations. Now we know much of that is tradition, but we do know that we walked on the ground where Jesus walked, and we saw the place where he was crucified, we saw the place where he was buried, we did visit some places where he suffered tremendously. We visited the Garden of Gethsemane. Now we saw some olive trees more than 2,000 years old. Same olive trees under which Jesus knelt and prayed and said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Those trees have stood there since that time. They're still bearing fruit, bearing olives over 2,000 years old. Now in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning with verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifies and they that sanctify are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praises unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him, and again behold I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. But verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is also able to succor them that are tempted. Now that's reading from Hebrews chapter 2 verses 9 through 18. I want to speak to you pertaining to the sufferings of our dear Lord. I don't know anyone that ever suffered like Jesus did. And what he had to endure as he carried the cross, as he died on the cross. Many times we forget about it. We read about Jesus in the Bible, which is good. We think about him being our Savior, which is wonderful. We think about him being our high priest. We think about him as coming back King of kings and Lord of lords. But many times we are prone to kindly forget about the suffering that he had to endure while he was on the earth. Now I want to mention some of that today, and then, of course, on next Sunday, as we talk about the resurrection, we appreciate even more the resurrection of our dear Lord. No man, no man ever suffered like the Lord Jesus. Now we know the apostle Paul suffered, no doubt about that, but he did not have the sin laid upon him and became a sin offering that Jesus had laid upon him when he came to die. That's why he prayed that prayer in the garden and said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Now he wasn't talking there about the whipping, the spitting in the face, the plucking out of the beard, the hitting over the head with a reed, or any of the punishment that he took. He wasn't talking about that when he prayed, Father, 
if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. What he was talking about there was the cup of sin. That is, he was to be made sin for us. He who knew no sin was made sin for us. That's why God the Father turned his back upon him and Jesus cried out in agony and said, My God, my God, why hast thou never committed a sin, never did anything wrong, but he's made a sin offering. And when all the sins of the whole world was laid upon him, God could not look on his son being made a sin offering and God turned his back upon him and Jesus died alone. That was the cup, the bitter cup that he had to drink and he was willing to do it. I want to mention many ways in which Jesus suffered today. Number one, he suffered in leaving heaven and entering the sin-cursed world. Now there's no comparison between this earth and heaven. Down here we have a little foretaste of glory. Down here we receive blessings. Down here our hearts are lifted. Down here we read about some of the great wonders of heaven. But there's absolutely no comparison. If we were to say you stepped out of the most beautiful home in the world and stepped out into a garbage dump, we still couldn't make a comparison. There's no way you can make a comparison between heaven and this earth. And when Jesus left glory, left the wonderful place of God in heaven, the paradise of God, the beautiful heaven, and stepped down on an earth, on a planet, that's cursed by sin, that's racked by the devil and his children, Jesus stepped down among men, filled with hatred, filled with sin and ungodliness. Men that had no sympathy. Men that despised and hated righteousness. And stepped down upon a planet cursed with sin from the time Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden to that very time. And when Jesus came down to the earth, he came right to the center of the earth. Now Jerusalem is in the center of the earth. And when Jesus came, he came to the center of the earth. Let me illustrate it like this, like a wagon wheel with the hub and all the spokes extending out from the hub. Now Jerusalem is the center of the earth. And of course, no better place could Jesus come to die for the sins of the world than for the very center of the earth. And that he did. He came down to Jerusalem to die on a cross. And he born in Bethlehem. Ministered in that vicinity and around Galilee. And then finally died on the cross. Now he suffered when he did it. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Though he was rich. Yet for your sakes he became poor. That ye through his poverty might be rich. It is not easy to leave heaven. It was not easy to leave the riches of the glory there and come down and live in poverty. Now the Son of God lived in poverty. He said the birds there have nests. The foxes have holes, but the Son of Man hath no place to lay his head. He came among the poorest of the poor. Now Jesus grew up in Nazareth. And Nazareth is one of the poorest cities in that land. Nazareth is a very, very poor place, still a place of poverty. And Jesus grew up in a place of poverty. A few weeks ago, we visited Mary's well there in Nazareth. There's only one well there. That well was there when Jesus was a little boy. And Mary went to that well to get her water. And no doubt many times Jesus went along with her as a little lad to that well to help maybe bring water, be with her as she went to get water. And it's a very poor place then, a very poor place now. So Jesus grew up in a place of poverty. He was a poor boy, if you please, on the earth. He was God. He left the riches of heaven. And he ate just the food that the poor people ate. He wore the kind of clothes as a lad that they wore. And he lived in the kind of uh, home, a cave or whatnot, or whatever kind of building they lived in, that 
All the poor people did there in Nazareth. Now he had to suffer when he stepped down from the beauty of heaven and come to this earth and live in poverty. That was a mighty step. That was the greatest step that was ever made when Jesus stepped from heaven down to this earth. Number two, he suffered as a babe when he was born. Now many times little children on this earth, they're born in hospitals. They're kept there until they're carried home. They are kept in bassinets. They're took care of by their mother. Many of them go to a warm, nice home in the winter, a nice, cool home in the summer. They have the best of care, and they're precious, but not Jesus. <laughs> when Jesus was a babe, he suffered as a baby. Many little babies today suffer. Yesterday, I conducted a funeral. I have a little baby about two months old, look like a little doll. It touched your heart, just look just like a little doll. Killed in a car wreck here a couple of days ago. I conducted that funeral of that little one. Only been here a couple of months, taken away. And of course, that's the business of God. We're not to question God about that, but there's a lot of suffering on this earth. Even among little infants, many of them are neglected, many of them are abused, many of them are mistreated. And today upon this earth, you have a lot of times dogs that have far more attention and far better care and better fed and better loved than a lot of precious little children in the world today. You'd be surprised that the little children come here unwanted and uncared for and thrown aside and neglected and abused and cursed and uh, suffer in that manner. Some don't have to, but some do suffer. Now, Jesus suffered as a babe. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 7, As she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, that's just plain, everyday on their clothes, and laid him in a manger, that's where they fed the cattle, because there's no room for them in the inn. So Jesus was not born in a hospital. He was not born in a home on a nice clean bed. He was born in a, in a cave in a cow stable. And they placed him in the manger there for his little bed, little bassinet, if you want to call it that. And so Jesus suffered as a baby. He came here suffering. He stepped down from heaven suffering. He came here suffering. He was born on the earth a suffering. Now when they traveled, he was carried either in the arms of Mary or Joseph, or he was carried in on the back of a donkey, or on a camel. Jesus didn't have a nice automobile in which to ride, not even a nice uh, buggy like people used a few years ago. He just had to travel by foot on a donkey or in the arms of his, of the mayor and Joseph, our friend. And he was driven from country to country. Why, before he was two years old, he had to leave Bethlehem and went all the way into Egypt, many miles away. It was my privilege to visit that place where they went and spent the time in Egypt. I'd never been there before until this last trip to Egypt, and we were carried by the guide to the place where Mary and Joseph brought Jesus when they fled from Bethlehem because Herod wanted to kill all the children two years old and under, so they had to flee for their lives. Down across that hot desert they went. On down in Egypt and remained there until Herod died. And then they came back and went to Nazareth. So even as a little infant, as a babe, he suffered. He had to endure the hot sun and the sand across that desert. They went on foot or by donkey or by camel. And it was a long, long journey. And Jesus suffered as a little babe. They had to care for him, try to shield him from the hot sun and the Insects, and mosquitoes, and whatnot, and he suffered. Number three, at the age of 12, he was left in the temple of Jerusalem. Now, you'd have thought they'd have been just a little more careful. Now, they came from Nazareth up to Jerusalem at this particular feast, and Jesus was 12 years old. And they went into the temple, and they did what they were supposed to do at the feast, and time came for them to leave. And Mary and Joseph got with the rest of their relatives and other neighbors to go back to Nazareth. <coughs> and they went 
quite a distance before they missed him. There they didn't even uh, consider whether he was in, in their midst or not. Now evidently, Mary must have thought, well, he's some with Joseph, or he's with the, some of our relatives, or he's with some of the other children. And she didn't say anything about it, neither did Joseph. And they traveled quite a distance before they missed him. And then Mary started looking around for him and said, Jesus, where are you? And she couldn't find him. They left him back there in the temple. And uh, so they turned around and went back. And for a couple of days, they searched around and they finally found him. And you know where they found him? They found him in the house of God. They found him in the temple. What was he doing? He was sitting there, a 12-year-old boy, talking to those great doctors of the law, doctors of the Old Testament, that knew all about religion and Judaism. And he was sitting there talking to them, and they, he was asking them questions, they were asking him questions. And he confounded them. He had so much knowledge of the Old Testament until they were amazed. They were dumbfounded at that little 12-year-old boy that had never been trained in a, a school or seminary to teach him about the Old Testament. And yet he confounded them. He asked them some questions they couldn't answer. And he answered every question they asked him. And he was sitting there alone and his parents had left him there. But he was busy. And Mary was upset and she said, the son said, why, we've been seeking these sorrowfully. He said, why did you uh, stay behind like this? He said, know you not that I must be about my father's business. Now his father's business was attaining to the word of God and worshiping there in the temple. And he was about his father's business. He wasn't in a little carton shop building or a little box or something. Like a school teacher one time tried to tell me in school that uh, she could just in her mind see Jesus there in that little carpenter shop building a little uh, box about his father's business. She didn't know what that meant. Well, it didn't mean he was a carpenter. It meant he was about his father's business in heaven. He was in the temple of God. They had talked to the doctors and lawyers. And so he was neglected, left behind. He was misunderstood even at the age of 12. Even Joseph and Mary couldn't fully understand what he did and all things he said. But the Bible said she pondered those things in her heart. And she remembered them. And then as he grew up, you hear no more about Jesus until he reached the age of 30. You may say, Preach Edwards, we find out about Jesus from the time he's born till approximately two years old. And then the Bible doesn't say anything else about him until he's 12 years old. And then he's mentioned... And then the Bible doesn't say anything else about him until he was 30 years old. Now why? The answer is this. It's obvious. God hid that phase of his life because in the world today, and since that time you have so much superstition and tradition pertaining to what Jesus did and where he went. If they knew all the trail of Jesus from the time he was born till he died on the cross, while religious people be trying to do the very same thing and do everything he did every year he did it just like some of the religious people in the world today in the Islam religion they go all the way to Mecca and it's their responsibility and duty to try to go there one time in a lifetime to go to Saudi Arabia to visit Mecca their religious place they think they're obligated to do that they think they're obligated to pray five times a day regardless with a face turned toward Mecca. Now can you imagine with the what Catholicism has done today with the life and things of Jesus pertaining to Jesus. What would they have done had they had a record of the entire life of Jesus? Well, beloved, God knew what he was doing when he hid most of the life of Jesus. His life is not the most important thing. His death on the cross is the most important thing. And so at the age of 12 you see him. And then at the age of 30. Why at the age of 30? Well, according to the Old Testament, a priest could not go into the ministry until he's 30 years old. <coughs> and Jesus was abiding by that law because he was priest, king, and savior. 
And he entered his ministry at the age of 30. And that was the law of the Old Testament that he, the man could enter the ministry at that age. And so he waited until he was 30 years old. They tried to kill him when he preached his first sermon. When the Son of God stood up there in Nazareth and preached his first sermon and read the Old Testament scriptures and said, This thing is now fulfilled before your very eyes. They carried him, drove him to a high cliff and tried to push him off and kill him. And he escaped out of their hands and went down the Sea of Galilee and far as we know did not go back to Nazareth. They tried to kill the Son of God when he preached his first sermon. The Bible said he was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And he stood over Jerusalem and wept. He wept out loud over Jerusalem. And Luke chapter 19 verse 41. And when he was come near he beheld the city and wept of it. Jesus stood there and watched over that city. Supposed to be a city of God. And he wept because of their sins. And because they had rejected the Messiah. The Bible said he had no place to lay his head. The foxes would go to their dens at night. The birds there would go to their nest. The Son of God had no place to lay his head. He was without a place to sleep. Many times he'd go to the home of Mary and Martha. Maybe he'd go out in the mountain and spend the night alone with God on the mountain. Many times maybe he'd go to a cave or some place and spend the night. He had no place to lay his head. He was hungry in the wilderness. In John chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. Forty days and nights, Jesus suffered in the wilderness of Judea. And there he was hungry, didn't eat a bite of anything for forty days and forty nights. He did that for a purpose. He suffered in agony. And then we come to the latter part of his ministry. The Bible said he was despised and hated more and more because of his teachings. And then at the Last Supper, in Luke chapter 22 and verse 15, he said, I desire... He to pass over with you before I suffer. He met the death he was to die. And then in the garden of Gethsemane when he was facing the cross. He prayed. He got out on his knees under those olive trees. And in Luke chapter 22 verse 42 said. Father if it be thy will remove this cup from me. Nevertheless not my will but thine be done. And the word of God tells us he sweated as it were great drops of blood. He was in such agony. Now he was suffering. Not because of the whipping he was to take. The abusing they would give him. The plucking out of his beard. The beating of him over the head with the staves. The hitting him with their fist. The cutting of his back. It was not that that he dreaded. What he dreaded was becoming sin. He was God. He was holy. And he hated sin. And he prayed that God might, if it could possibly be God's will, that he wouldn't be made a sin offering. And he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Then he said this, he said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And he went on to accomplish that that he came yet to accomplish. And they met him with swords and staves. And Judas his cat went up and betrayed him with a kiss. There they came to take the Son of God that never harmed anyone. He was like a little lamb. Never harmed a soul. Never harmed anyone. Never did anything wrong. And when they came to take him, they came with staves and swords. Like they'd come to take a common criminal. There they grabbed him and like you'd grab a criminal. As if though he might try to escape. He'd have been in there. He'd been around them. Teaching among them all this time. They never had tried that. Why? His time hadn't come. That's why. In the priest's palace where the scribes and elders were assembled. The Bible said they spit in his face. Now I won't have time to tell you why they did that. They did that for a purpose. They spit in his face for a purpose. And then they smote him with the palms of their hands. They'd walk up and hit him with the palms of their hands. And then they blindfolded him. And they said, now you claim to be a prophet. Tell us who hit you. And they'd walk up and they would hit him in the face or on the body. And they said, now you supposed to be a prophet. Tell us who hit you. 
prophesy if you're a prophet. And then they walked up to him and he had beard. And they reached and they literally took hold of that beard with their hands. And they jerked it out. You find that in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6. Literally jerking the hair from his face. You know that had to be painful. And they spit in his face. They slapped him. They beat him. They hit him overhead with the staffs. They carried him out there and they took this long whip with a little piece of iron in the end of it. With nine pieces of iron in the end of it. And they would come down with that whip and they would jerk it. And they would rip the flesh in his back down his back and that was a full fear of the scripture where it said they plowed furs upon my back and so they abused him and mistreated him every way possible and he had never done anybody to harm never done anything but that which was good loved the people helped the people and yet he was very god a perfect man and that's the way they treat him and then they brought him to the judgment hall they spit on him they scourged him and then somebody said he said he's a king and if he's a king, he needs a crown. And they went out and gathered some thorns. And out of those thorns, they made a crown, making light of it. Not a real crown, but a crown of thorns, made out of thorns. And they brought that crown in, and they said, Now, if he's a king, he needs a crown. And they go over laughing and mocking, and they take that crown of thorns, and they souge it down on top of his head. Those thorns penetrated into his head. And no doubt the blood began to run from his head, down his face, down his back, and upon his shoulder. That terrible crown of thorns. They said, well, he's a king and he's a crown. And they put the thorns on his head. Then they took a reed and they smote him across the head. Matthew 27, 30 said they hit him across the head with that reed. No doubt many times. And then they mocked him. They said, now, if you be a king, if you be God, do something about it. And when they got through with all of that beating and plucking out his beard, spitting in his face and whipping him, and they said, all right, we're going to crucify him and let's just let him carry his own cross. That would be good enough for him. Let him carry his own cross. And so they took an old rugged cross and they laid it up on the bloody back of our Lord. Blood running down his face. He had been plucked out in many places, spittle in what beard that remained, uh, maybe knots on his head when they hit him with the stabs, his back bloody when they plowed down his back with those uh, whips of cattails of nine pieces of lead in the end of them, steel and ripped his back. They had beat him until he didn't look like a human being. The Bible said there's no beauty about him that could be desired. He just looked like an old beat up piece of beef that you'd beat up to cook. He was just beaten and bruised and bloody. And there they took that old rugged Roman cross and they laid it up on his back. They said you're to be crucified on Golgotha's hill and we want you to carry your own cross be good enough for you. And they placed the cross on his back and the Son of God without saying one word Began to walk along with that cross. Evidently, he had lost so much blood and he was physically weak and maybe his knees a little shaky. The Bible doesn't say he fell on the cross. It doesn't say that. But after he'd gone a certain distance, they probably noticed that he was suffering so and lost so much blood that he was kind of weak and maybe his knees trembling. There was a black man walking along beside of him there. And they said, all right, let's just take this cross then off of him. It looked like he, he's suffering. Or maybe they thought maybe he might fall under the cross, which he, the Bible doesn't say he did. But they took that old rugged cross and laid it up on Cyrene, Simon of Cyrene. Uh, he was a, a colored man. And, and they placed that cross up on him. And he walked along, no doubt, behind Jesus with that cross as a son of God went on up to Gargarth's hill. When they reached Golgotha's hill, there they laid the cross down and then they took Jesus and laid him down on the cross. And they took huge spikes and a hammer. And those Roman soldiers, strong, muscular men, took those big old spikes and those hammers and they nailed his hands to that cross. They took his feet and put one foot on top of another 
at the bottom and then nail those feet to that cross. That put him in terrible agony. And then they raised that cross up and dropped it in a hole. And when they dropped that cross in that hole, no doubt the pain shot through his body. And they say that's one of the most agonizing deaths that you can suffer to die on a cross like that. And the Son of God, hanging there on the cross, said, I thirst. They said, if he's thirsty, give him some vinegar. That'd be good enough for him. And they went and got some vinegar and gave it to him. And him thirsty, he lost blood, he was thirsty. Instead of water, they gave him vinegar. And then God turned his back upon him. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And there Jesus, the Bible said, gave up the ghost. He died. When they came around to break the legs of the men on the cross, they had to take them down before sunset according to the law. They went and broke the legs of one thief on one side that he might die quit much quicker and they Broke the legs of the other thief and went to break the legs of Jesus and he is already dead. They didn't have to break his legs. The Bible said in the Old Testament not one bone of him would be broken. And he fulfilled that scripture. He dropped his head, bowed his head, gave up the ghost and went down into paradise that day with one of those thieves and they buried his body. Next Sunday the Lord willing will tell you what happened to that body they buried. Let's stand our feet. Dear fathers, we come today. We pray that you take the message and use it. We know our dear Lord suffered, bled and died for the sins of mankind. Lord, we know today if man rejects that, if he fails to accept that, he'll die and go to hell. There's nothing more Jesus could have done to save sinners. God, I pray today that you'll speak to many hearts. Save somebody today as a result of this message of suffering our dear Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As David plays for us, if you're here unsaved, you're here backslidden, you're here want to join the church, or for any reason that you want to come forward, you may, while she plays a couple of stanzas. The door of the church is open. If you're backslidden on God, want to come back now, it'd be a good time. If you want to get saved, you'd find no better time. Would you come? While we wait, would you come? God is speaking.